Hello, everybody. Welcome back. I hope it was enough time to have a snack and do whatever you need to do to get back um, to this meeting in with full attention, because now we're going to even more complicated thing. We're going to a session where we'll be talking about the imaging technology in, in instrumentation. And now on the slide, you can see what is the, uh, the agenda for this afternoon. And uh, I hope that it will be it will go as smoothly as the morning session. So without further ado, please uh, welcome Dr. Ben Sui from Johns Hopkins talking about quantitative spec as at its ev evolution in the past 30 years. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first, I would like to thank NIB and Dr. George Subo for inviting me to make my presentation at this exciting uh, workshop. Next slide. This shows my couple of disclosure that's relevant to the subject matter of this presentation. Next slide. This show a brief outline of my presentation. Next slide. First, I'd like to introduce our definition of quantity, and which is to estimate or measure the quantity of precisely and accurately. So the, the definition of quantitative spec is the method that accurately and precisely estimate three dimensional distribution of radioactivity in vivo. Next slide. So the goals of quantitative spec are to achieve the best possible image quality and to achieve the best possible quantitative accuracy. Next slide. Conventional image reconstruction methods based on the analytical filter back projection method provides accurate reconstructed images if and only if the projection data are ideal and noise free. Next slide. However, experimental acquired and or clinical data are affected by the following image data degradation factors. They include the statistical fluctuation in the detected counts, photon attenuation, photons scatter, collimator detector response, and patient motions. Next slide. So um, the effect of image degradation factors severely affect the reconstructed image quality. This shows you the realistic spec images obtained from the filter back projection uh, reconstruction methods are prone to image artifacts and are not quantitative. Next slide. So the early attempts of quantitative specs has been going on in the 1970s through the 1980s and 1990s. So they include several methods and especially for the analytical solution to the image reconstruction problem, which includes the image degradation uh, factors uh, uh, remains elusive. Next slide. So there are also um, iterative image reconstruction methods that have been attempted in the 1970s and the 1980s. And there are two major categories. The first are uh, iterative reconstruction method without models of the statistical noise fluctuation. They're plagued with uh, noise amplification, convergence, and uniqueness problem. So they are not very useful. The second major category are uh, so-called the statistical iterative image reconstruction methods that are based on the solution of image reconstruction formulation with a model of statistical noise fluctuation. And the iterative algorithm is used to seek estimate of the solution. Next slide. So the quantitative image reconstruction method basically uh, is a statistical uh, iterative image reconstruction method with a system response modeling. The key components are the statistical image uh, iterative image reconstruction algorithm that described earlier and also the model of imaging process. Next slide. And the, the statistical noise assumption include the Poisson, Gaussian models, et cetera, and an iterative algorithm uh, include the C gradient, the CG, and the EM algorithm. And then the model of the physics of the imaging process, including attenuation, collimator detector response, and the scatter. The advantage is that you allow the modeling of noise statistic, the projection data, to provide a good noise handling, and also allow modeling of the image process to give rise to accurate quantitation. And it's useful when the analytical solutions are not available. 
the disadvantage is require intensive uh, computation and problem with convergence and uniqueness. Next slide. And however, there were two major breakthrough uh, to make the quantitative spec image reconstruction uh, practical. The first is in 1982, the development of the ML and EM algorithm, which is based on the Poisson statistic, which accurately model this noise fluctuation in the acquired data. It has superb image noise handling, but has a very slow convergence and impractical for clinical use. The second breakthrough um, is in 1992 for the development of the OS uh, EM um, algorithm developed by Hudson and Larkin, Larkins. It has superb image noise handling, similar to that of uh, MLEM, but have increased convergence rate with increased number of subsets, which allow uh, it for clinical use. Next slide. So this, show, this slide shows the, the comparison between the filter back projection image and the MLEM images. So for the filter back projection image, the variance image are approximately uniform, independent of the image count density. That means that the noise fluctuation is the same across the image. However, in the MLEM algorithm, the variance image shows that the, it is approximately depending on the image count density. So it's better to visualize the structures of load count density area. So that is a very good uh, reconstruction method with noisy images. Next slide. So this also shows the different uh, characteristic of the statistical iterative image reconstruction methods. Um, the most important is the MLEM has the best image noise handling a very slow convergence. And the OSEM is the most popular due to its good noise handling and fast convergence rate. Next slide. And this will show an example of the application of quantitative spec to photon attenuation compensation. This will show you that um, in, a, in a simulation study using the 3D uh, MCAT phantom. And uh, this the lab show you the, uh, the phantom with a different mm -hmm. uh, defect in the phantom. And then on the right, to show you the uh, filter back projected images with attenuation compensation, which shows uh, some image artifacts, uh, very, which is very important for clinical diagnosis. Next slide. And this shows you with the uh, MLEM reconstructed image with attenuation compensation. <clears throat> the image artifact that shows in the filter back projection is much reduced. Next slide. And then based on the study, uh, in the in the 90s, you know, all the company, most of the company uh, in spec had developed a um, transmission CT uh, system, subsystem based on um, the scanning line source, the stationary line, line source, and multiple line source, um, instead of using the, uh, the sheet source, which is a, a difficult to implement. However, next slide, the, the radionuclide based transmission CT subsystem turns out to be expensive to maintain in the long run with re replacing the radionuclide source. So in 1995, um, Dr. Bush Hasagawa developed the first um, uh, spec CT system and for attenuation compensation purpose. And this turns out to be also the first multiple uh, modality medical imaging system ever. Next slide. And this, in, so in a few years later in 1999, and GE come out with the first generation commercial dual uh, spec CT system, uh, initially for attenuation compensation using a low end a CT. And this slide shows the spec image with no attenuation um, compensation. And then also they see the, all the image artifact and then show you the CT image. When you combine the two in the attenuation compensation, you see the much more accurate uh, spec images and then uh, an image and then you prevent um, GE thought to fuse the two image to get a few CT, a spec CT image. It turns out to be something which is very useful in clinical diagnosis. So the, the so spec CT become now becoming the uh, stable uh, of the standard uh, uh, spec system. Next slide. So for, you know, for quantitative spec, application of quantitative spec to collimator detector response compensation and um, this shows you the components of the collimator detector response. And then the, um, the implementation gone through the earlier model, which involved extensive computation to later on the most simplified model allow much reduced computation for the clinical application. Next slide. 
Then this shows you the effectiveness of the application of quantitative spec to compensate for the collimator detector response. And it shows that first, they improve the resolution and lower the image noise at the same time, which is a very unique property compared to the conventional image processing method. It reduces the image artifact and also it provides, it shows that the 3D uh, compensation method is more effective uh, than the 2D method. Next slide. And then uh, this is show you the application to um, for medium uh, and high energy photons and collimator. And it shows that for the filter back projection for this type of um, application has severe image artifact, uh, blurring and noise. And then with the, the compensation, the accurate compensation, you can see the significant improvement in the image quality, uh, resolution recovery, noise reduction, and also artifact reduction. And this is this important properties um, are important in the application to targeted radio immunotherapy. Next slide. So for the application of quantitative spec to photon scatter is more complicated because of this, the uh, scatter response, complicated uh, scatter response function. Next slide. In the early scatter com compensation method, basically based on the uh, dual energy and, and triple energy window methods that estimate the scatter component and subtract it from the detector response. However, the subtraction uh, enhanced the, the, the noise um, in the image. And for the quantitative scatter compensation method, uh, we can apply to the uniform and non-uniform scatter medium, and it, it provides a more accurate estimate of scatter and a good compensation and good noise handling. But the disadvantage is more complex modeling and non computation time. Next slide. And there was a common misconception uh, in the application of quantitative spec in the early days. This show you a clinical study with patient uh, with low likelihood of disease. And to show you that uh, with a maximum likelihood uh, EM algorithm with attenuation correction, there was a um, artifacts in the inferior wall of the myocardium. And the question is, does quantitative attenuation compensation over uh, correct? Next slide. And when you show um, the um, maximum likelihood EM uh, with additional uh, detector response correction and also the uh, scatter correction, and uh, it shows that the artifact goes away. And it shows that the um, maximum, the attenuation correction fully compensate for attenuation effect in doing so, it brings out the effect of scatter and additional scatter compensation uh, with provided quantitative information. However, uh, this misconception have uh, delayed the uh, acceptance of quantitative spec in, uh, in, the, in the clinic for a number of years. Next slide. And then the implementation of quantitative spec, um, the requirements are important. They are especially in the quality control aspect of the implementation. Um, that include the important requirement of good quality spec images and good quality CT images and the accurate alignment of the spec and CT images. Okay, this, the images shows you the image artifact in the, uh, my, uh, in the myocardial spec images uh, produced, mis generated by the misalignment of the CT and spec images. And then the right set of slide sh as images shows the uh, reduction of the image artifact with the register uh, CT and spec images. Next slide. And then the next application, important application is the estimation of radioactivity in vivo. This will show you the result from experimental Indian 111 spec phantom study using the RSD torso phantom, which is filled um, with Indian 111 uh, solution with activity concentration, different concentration in the organ cavity and also two spherical inserts with different sizes. And the right hand images shows you the images, uh, spec images, the different uh, imagery construction uh, with compensation of attenuation, additional detector response, scatter, so on. Next slide. This slide shows the um, result of the um, quantitative estimation. 
and show you the percent error in the total activity estimation in the heart, lungs, and liver cavities, and also the two different size spheres. To show you with low compensation, there was a huge percent error. But with addition of attenuation compensation, scatter compensation, and partial volume compensation, the percent error is substantially reduced. Next slide. And the recent events of uh, multiple, I mean, quantitative uh, spec, um, the, include the application of individualized targeted radio immunotherapy, and which is a topic of this uh, workshop, which I'm not going to pay detail because you will hear a lot about it. Next slide. And this is a list of the summary um, of my presentation due to time. I'm going to go to the next slide. And this is show you the future challenges, which include the, that we have to address some of the common myths and misconception, which is prevailing. Uh, in certain image uh, uh, community. Next slide. And this is a list of the future outlook due to time. I'm going to leave you to, uh, to read it. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Uh, I think we have time for one question, if there are any, George. Um, I don't see any questions typed into QA or chat. We might want to just remind people to uh, continue typing in questions uh, in real time while the uh, speaker is talking, uh, or if they think of a question later, we will uh, keep, uh, keep track of all of them and go through them during the panel discussion. Yes, that's, that's very relevant um, comment, especially in light of the next speaker who is not will not be able to, to, to be here in person for the question, for the answers, but still please write the questions and either someone on the panel will be answering them during panel discussion, or we definitely forward it to the presenter. In this case, it will be uh, Eric Frey from Johns Hopkins again. And, um, and, and he will, I'm sure that he'll get back to you with answer. So what we're doing right now, we're going on to have a presentation by Dr. Eric Frey, Jobs Hopkins. He will be talking about shortcomings on current imaging systems and what is needed in future systems. So that's another uh, statement of challenges that we have. Thank you. I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to talk today. Um, the title of my talk I came up with in about 2000, late 2019. I'm not sure what I was thinking when I did, but here we go. I have a couple things I need to disclose, but I'm not going to take time to talk about that. Um, this is an outline of what I'm going to talk about. First, I'm going to talk about the imagery requirements for targeted radionuclide therapy, some of the characteristics of, of the therapeutic radionuclides that make that challenging, um, what we can achieve with uh, current gamma cameras, and understanding what some of the limitations are, the sources of limitations for the current, current systems and what's needed for future gamma cameras in order to achieve the things we'd like to. So in the targeted radionuclide therapy, the first thing we like to avoid, do is avoid um, toxicities for normal tissues. Um, for optimal therapy, we'd also like to, to know how much we're delivering to tumors so we know if we're delivering a lethal dose and we can titrate the administered activity so that we're not giving more than is necessary. In order to do that, we need to be able to image the, the large organs. Things like the liver and the kidneys are, are often uh, dose-limiting organs. For some radionuclide, uh, radionuclide therapies, the, some smaller organs are important, like the renal cor cortex or bone marrow, lacrimal glands, um, salivary glands, and so on. To do, um, for tumor dose symmetry, obviously, we need to image the tumors. Um, and to, to optimally use 3D dose symmetry, we really need to have accurate to voxel levels. Some of the radionuclides are, that are used in targeted radionuclide therapy are shown here. I'm gonna to talk today about two, radium-223 and thorium-227 that are alpha emitters. Should show you their decay schemes. Um, you can see that this is radium-223. The decay scheme is quite complicated. There are a number of daughters. Um, the, the lead-211 is uh, has a long half-life. So ideally, we'd like to be able to image the bismuth-211. Um, um, you can see from the, the table of, of the photons that are imaged, we do have some photons we can image. The abundances are relatively low, and we have some high-energy photons that make that challenging. Um, for thorium, in addition to imaging the radium, we, we, we have the decay of the thorium to the radium that has an 18-day half-life. So we definitely would like to be able to image the, the, um, in the thorium and the radium at the same time. Um, you can see that there are photon peaks that are um, 
such that we can do that. Again, the abundances are relatively low and some of the energies are high, so it kind of complicates the imaging. Just in summary, the radionuclides you use for targeted radionuclide therapy often have complicated disk case schemes with multiple daughters. Um, for some of them, we'd like to be able to image the uh, position of the daughters, so do simultaneous multiple radionuclide imaging. The, the energy spectrum are complicated. There are multiple photon emissions. They're high energy photons and the abundances are often low. Um, in addition, especially for alpha emitters, the therapeutic efficacy is high, so the administered activities are low. Um, so what's achievable with, with current gamma cameras? Um, this is some, some old data from Indium-111 spec. Indium-111 was used as a surrogate for yttrium-90, still often used as a surrogate. Um, this is some simulated data, realistic simulation, where we looked at the accuracy and precision for um, you know, some important large organs, um, plus the marrow. And you can see in, in this case, we can do very well, less than 5% error and precision is even better than that. What happens for a more complicated radionuclide? This is the case of radium-223. Again, this is a, a simulation study. Um, we modeled the activity distribution based on, on the literature and uh, administered activity based on, on that for uh, radium-223 chloride. Um, this shows some, some sample reconstructed images. You can see that they're, they're noisy. Um, th just for rel um, to show you that this isn't a complete fabrication, this is a patient image, This the lone patient image that we have. A, um, that has similar, similar kind of characteristics. Um, these are, this shows the um, errors, even, even with those images, we're able to achieve, you know, relatively unbiased estimates of the activity in, the, in these large organs. Um, and the precisions, even though the images are noisy because we're summing up over a large region, the precisions are, are quite reasonable. Now let's move to the case of thorium-227, where we'd like to image both the thorium and the radium. Um, to investigate that, this is an anema phantom where we replaced the, the largest, the smallest sphere with the, another one of the large ones. We filled uh, the, five of the spheres with thorium and, and one of the spheres with radium. Um, and then by imaging at different days, we could get different mixtures be just because of the de decay of thorium into radium, different um, ratios of thorium to radium. So I'm going to show you some data from day four. Um, this is a sample of the, the projections that we got from the, the two, in two energy windows that we use to um, do the simultaneous reconstruction. We do that reconstruction, we get an image of the radium and of the thorium, and if we quantify those, we see that we got about a 16% error for the radium and 8% uh, for the thorium. So now moving to smaller things, if we were trying to Im interested in imaging and quantifying tumors, this shows some, some older data from Indium-111 with a medium energy collimator. Um, you can see this is for a range of tumor sizes. And if you look, the accuracies are all quite good. Um, however, if we go to smaller tumors, uh, tumors that are less than the resolution for a medium energy collimator, um, you know, 1.3 centimeters and smaller, we start to get um, much larger errors. Now, if we go down to the voxel level, um, one of the things we like to do with uh, in voxel dose symmetry is calculate the dose volume histogram. And those are often input into radiobiological models to let you do things like predict normal tissue complication probabilities or the um, tumor control probabilities. Um, and this shows that there's some errors in those. And sp sp particularly important is the errors at these low, um, low activities. Um, these can give have substantial effects on, on the uh, those nonlinear um, dose metrics. So it's just a summary of what's kind of currently achievable, even for difficult radionuclides for organ size objects, I think 10 to 15% um, accuracies are, are quite achievable. Um, you can pr provide some information about the distribution of daughter radionuclides in some cases, although it's, it's perhaps not as good as one might like. Um, the tumor activity con quantification is achievable for small, for large tumors, but for small tumors, it's not really very reliable. And for the, at the voxel level, the voxels are really not estimable parameters um, and so really the, the, with current systems at, at the voxel level, we're just not able to get very good, um, very good estimates of, for the, as inputs for 3D dose symmetry. So just now I just want to talk about why there's some of these limitations of current systems. And just as a review, this is what a current spec CT system looks like. There's a CT system in the back. We have two, two heads. They're based on the, most clinical systems are based on assimilation um, detector and a, and a collimator that is a, a mechanical lens. Looking at some of the characteristics, the energy resolution is in the order of 9% at 140 keV. 
Um, the axial field of view is about four centimeters. So that means to, to image all the important organs, we need at least two or three bed positions. Um, the transaxial field of view is about 55 centimeters, which is wide enough to image most patients. Um, there are two cameras, meaning that we only are collecting data from two projection views at a time. We need to rotate the camera, you know, for 15 to 30 different um, projections to acquire data. Depending on what radionuclide we're using, we need to select the appropriate collimator, either high energy or medium energy collimator. And each of those have different resolution and um, sensitivity characteristics. Uh, the sensitivity for a uh, uh, high energy collimator is on the order of you collect about seven photons out of 10 to the fifth, every, out of every 10 to the fifth that are uh, removed with a resolution at 10 centimeters of about um, one to one, 1.2 to 1.3 um, centimeters. Um, a real, probably a more relevant distance would be at 20 centimeters so that the resolutions would be about, about um, twice that, the full with half max resolutions. For medium energy collimator, the sensitivities are a, a little bit higher depending on, on the, um, the actual details of the design and commercial systems, medium energy collimators have a little bit better resolution than for the high energy collimators. So what does that have imply in terms of what we can get for the, reconst the, the reconstructed spec images? So we can think about a spec imaging system as being um, the application of a, an imaging system matrix to the projection, to the um, activity distribution. Um, there's noise that's added and, and the noise is a function of the, the counts and the projection data. Um, and that gives you the, the projections, which are the raw data. To get the images, we then need to reconstruct them. And the reconstruction we get from using a reconstruction operator um, that acting on the projections. And that reconstruction operator usually involves a system model. So I use the symbol C sub R here. Um, we think about that a little, the result of that um, using the equation down here, we think about inverting that matrix. Um, it's not uh, you know, strictly invertible. So we have to do some kind of pseudo inverse. Um, and because we're using a, the, the system model, which may not be the same as the actual imaging system, um, there's some difference between that. So the so by, we get biases when when the product of this inverse and the the matrix the the system model aren't isn't aren't the identity matrix. Um, and in addition, because the system matrix it depends on the the patient and is, is a random variable, then the combination of the noise and the random variations in the in the the errors that we get um, from applying this inverted system model to the actual system model um, give imprecisions in the data. To illustrate that, this shows the, the case of attenuation compensation. If we use a system matrix that doesn't model attenuation and do the reconstruction, then we get um, errors in the image. We get uh, biases that are spatially varying. Um, however, even if we do use the, the appropriate system model, we may not be able to get recover the, the activity distribution exactly. Um, and this considers the case of detector response compensation. So the fact that the collimators have finite acceptance angle results in, in blurring of the images. Um, that blurring can be described by the modulation transfer function, which looks like a Gaussian. And essentially the images are convolved with a, a Gaussian that depends on the distance from the face of the collimator. Um, if we include models of that in the reconstruction, then we can recover um, some of the resolution, but but the but at some point the, the amount of information is much less than the noise and we won't be able to perfectly recover the information. So the, the reconstruction acts like a, a low pass filter where we lose the, the high frequency information in the image. And you can see that in the sample image, this shows um, a reconstruction with filter back projection. We then reconstruct, so it doesn't model the detect response. If we do model the detect response and use many iterations without noise in the image, we get um, an imperfect um, recovery of the original when we lose, we don't see the small objects very well. We get these ringing artifacts. And this just shows a comparison that the that the um, reconstruction is kind of like modeling the, the the result of a Gaussian um, low pass or a Gaussian filter applied to the image, and the detect response compensation is like a the application of a Butterworth low pass filter. Um, in addition, if we have noise in the image, then the different compensations have effect a, 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 a spatially varying effect on the noise, um, and that has implications in terms of what we can do for three um, D with three D dosimetry. So what's needed in future systems? Uh, future systems, we need an improved resolution. Um, I think that probably a, to do tumor, reasonable tumor dose imagery, you'd like to get a resolution of at least one centimeter, um, possibly better, um, at a distance of 20 centimeters. Um, and that means that's really about maybe four times better than what we can achieve now with a high energy uh, collimator. 
The problem with that is the sensitivity, at least for power hole collimators, goes as one over the resolution squared. So if we want to get uh, four times better resolution, then that means we have one sixteenth as many counts. And so then we have that much more noise in the images. So in order to kind of compensate for that, we'd like to improve the sensitivity. And because of these radio, some of these radionuclides are, are, are the administered activities are low, I think we like sensitivities that are increased by at least a factor of 10. Um, imaging times are a, pr a problem right now. As I mentioned, we typically have to image for th um, two to three bed positions. And the imaging times are usually about 30 minutes per bed position. So we're talking about imaging patients for an hour to hour and a half. And so getting patients into the clinic to do that is, is quite challenging. Um, if we were able to re image the, reduce the imaging time to 15 minutes for the whole body image, um, that would, I think, make it much easier to, to um, recruit patients to do dose symmetry. Um, we need to improve the energy resolution for some of these alpha emitters where we'd like to image the daughters. Um, and improved energy resolution would also, also allow um, improved rejection of scatter um, and downscatter from some of those high energy um, photons. And finally, something I haven't mentioned at all, but it's especially a problem for longer imaging times, is if we really want to achieve resolutions of one centimeter or better, then motion starts to be important and things like breathing motion and some of the progress that's been made in PET um, needs to be applied to SPECT. So how do we do that? I think we need new detector materials, um, either scintillators with lo higher light output or, or um, solid state photo detectors that give rise to, that have better energy resolution characteristics and can be used to create detectors with better intrinsic spatial resolution. I think we're gonna need novel collimation geometries that, that are more efficient than parallel hole geometries um, and let us use larger crystal areas to, to um, improve the overall system sensitivity. I think we're going to need improved intrinsic resolution, and that's necessary in order to both improve the, the spatial resolution and the system spatial resolution and sensitivity. More detector areas needed. I think we need larger axial field of views and multiple cameras so that we can reduce the acquisition time and improve the sensitivity. We're going to need thicker detectors to stop some of those high energy photons. The 3 8 inch detectors that we use now are really optimized for 140 kV photons. And I think there's going to be need to be advances in, in efficient modeling of the image formation so that we continue to have accurate reconstruction. Um, those, those advances need to, to track the advances that are made in the actual camera systems. And how do we achieve that? Well, it's going to take, I think it's going to take money and effort. And I've just made some quick cartoons here to show that some of the things that detectors, you can't build new detectors without, without money to buy the material. Um, and it also takes effort, um, people, people working on it. Some things like the novel collimation and geometries take um, some money to build them, the geometry, but they primarily take work of people to, to uh, come up with them and, and develop the reconstruction methods and so on. Um, I'd like to, I, I just think in order to do that and build systems that, that some of the limits of that imposed by the R01 mechanism aren't being enough, 500,000 a year for four years, um, plus budget cuts just isn't enough to provide the resources to buy the materials and the, and the effort that's needed. And finally, I think there's going to need to be collaboration with industry because industry has some knowledge and, and um, expertise that that's not, doesn't exist in academia. And I'd like to just close um, by thanking the uh, NIH for supporting the work with various grants and some of the collaborators and um, people who've um, helped with this project. Thanks. So we're right on target. It's 2.30 and it's time to move to the next presentation that will be by Dr. Liang Meng. And we'll be talking about the limits, characteristics of SPECT imaging, possibilities for Compton cameras. Dr. Meng. Well, um, first of all, thank you for, for this opportunity to come in to present our recent work and some thoughts in future directions in this very nice workshop. So today I'm going to talk about some development of spectral spec imaging instrumentation and the possibility of Compton cameras. Okay, so I am um, uh, so I'm going to talk about start from some current limitation and potential future directions. And then I'll move on to the development of advanced spec instrumentation in my lab. And also I will, I will have a, I will share a few thoughts on Compton camera. And finally, I'll present one page as a final remark. So as a challenge and challenges and opportunities for modern spec instrumentation, we already have several speakers having very nice presentation around this topic. So I'll make it really brief. I'll skip through some, some slides that people have been, but, and uh, I'll move into right into the point. So as the major limitation of spec imaging, there's no secret, which is the sensitivity. That current spec system does not have the sensitivity that can match, for example, PET imaging. Um, 
even though we just actually lower by one or two order of magnitude. As we as we're showing here, some commercial system, those are the commercial, those are the spatial uh, sensitivity provided by the commercial system, they're typically be by the order of hundreds per mega micro. So which is truly a few order magnitude a few orders of magnitude lower than what being offered by PET instrumentation. Now, which limit the quantitative accuracy of spec images and also limits its ability to follow dynamic process as well. So it's a very well-known limit that people have been fighting for the past 20, 30 years. But on the other hand, the, I think there are some opportunities coming up for further improving spec imaging capability. And uh, some of those being, one is the uh, imaging sensor is still the key. So there's still a lot of room to play to have a better and better imaging sensors. And the visual sensors, it is possible to have a future clinical spec system to have a sensitivity up to 1% or even higher over a large field view at the same time. And also the spec imaging can offer the ability, so-called hyperspectral spec imaging. Therefore, you can have a system to have an energy resolution that is so good that you can simultaneously differentiate multiple gamma lines, almost any combination of gamma lines coming from typical radio tracers using nuclear medicine, in therapeutic, and therapeutic agents like alpha emitters, beta emitters, and so on, as long as they do have a gamma line, clear gamma line. And the other capability, the possibility is in vivo microscopy in clinical spec context. So in other words, we can, there, it is possible to achieve sub millimeter speech resolution in spec imaging in clinically relevant objects, for example, in the brain, in some other organs, and so on. So that is a territory to be claimed. And finally, because the sensor has been improving so much, and then it's possible that would let's revisit Compton imaging as a capability, as a possibility to improve stack imaging capability, especially at higher energy gamma rays or energy, higher energy gamma rays. So I'm going to go through some of those points in the, in the future slides. So one of the major, major areas in my lab is the developing advanced CDT sensors. So this is one of the current directions we're going for. So so essentially combining small pixel CCT cadmium telluride sensors with uh, radar ASICs to provide us modular sensors. So what, what we're shooting for is, uh, for example, using this exam as an example, is to have a sensor to have a speech resolution down to 250 microns or smaller, at the same time provide a very high energy resolution so that those will become truly high performance imaging spectrometers. And now we're considering building them into imaging system. So for the energy resolution offered by the sensor, I'm using this example, just to this typical Amarism 241 plus Cobalt 57 source. And now we zoom into two different regions. As you can, you can see that you can actually differentiate, you can actually see those little peaks, some of those only being one KB apart, the actual escape peaks. We typically do not see them in most of the other sensors using spec imaging. Nevertheless, that we can, in the near future, we can build those systems, build those sensors into the system. Therefore, your system might be able to differentiate two gamma lines a few KB apart. Therefore, we can truly facilitate future inspect system to image multi-colors, multi isotope at the same time. And on top of this, we're also working on machine learning technique that to further improve the speech resolution and the gamma and the, and the resolution in those sensors. Make this, in this case, we're making use of so-called charge sharing effect, which happens in the small pixel CCT sensors. And then those charge sharing, the signal being shared by model pixels can be used to, to further enhance the localization of the interactions. So in here, we're showing the example of having a pencil beam striking on within the boundary of one single pixel being 250 microns. So in such a case, the, by using the charge sharing pattern and then doing, using machine learning to estimate the position, we will be able to locate, relocate, locate a gamma rate, the position of the gamma rate inter interaction with an accuracy that is well below 250 microns. In here, we're showing really it's below 100 micron resolution by using a charge, charge sharing pattern. So just the bottom line here is by combining the advanced electronics, sensor design, and also combining the technical imaging process, the signal processing technique like machine learning, it is possible that in the near future, we will have a gamma ray sensor that is very sensitive and also having spectral, having very high spectral resolution. And at the same time, give you a very high speech resolution below say approaching 100 microns. So th this will be tremendously powerful sensor for, to be considered, considered for future spec imaging system. So we're currently working on combining all those know-how into future sensors, providing a very large, very large area being flexible, and now we can build them into different clinical spec systems. Okay, so based on this sensor development, we have been developing a number of 
um, preclinical and clinical imaging system. One of those being this small animal spec system that, that can put into the MR, put in MR scanner for simultaneous MR spec imaging study. So we have been publishing this, this capability the prospect. But on, on top of this, this system would have a very high speed, very high energy resolution as we're showing here. So we can separate the gamma ray lines from almost any combination, once again, of gamma ray of a uh, video tracers that are typically used in nuclear medicine. Therefore, we can use this system to build up a multicolor image, multi isotope image very easily. And the second development I'm going to mention is this uh, This is ongoing development based on collaboration with uh, Dr. Sinusas, Chi Lu, and Yale, and uh, Scott Mitzler at UPenn. We're developing a clinical spec system, and uh, this system is optimized for imaging the leg and the foot using the blood perfusion extremities. So, in this, uh, in this system, to stretch the system to cover a larger field view, and now we're using this uh, this uh, checkerboard pattern. So this uh, this is the area filled by CDT. This is the area not filled by CDT. So we can we actually make use of this checkerboard pattern to design so-called adaptive or dynamic collimator. So we have two sets of collimators installed on this uh, on this uh, aperture plate, and then this plate can be shaped in front of the camera by one pitch to facilitate those two different imaging configuration in real time. So we can push a button to switch between those two. Or that could put different imaging characteristics and therefore offer sometimes ultra high sensitivity, sometimes ultra high spatial resolution, all very high, very wide field view. And also, we are currently, we recently proposed to build a so called alpha spec system, which is a full size clinical system that really put a lot of the things we know of um, using something we call a synthetic compound like gamma camera. So, in, in this case, the entire system is a combination of 500, 600 little gamma camera elements. So each is say a few millimeter, a few centimeters in size, and they have its own own aperture. So this uh, 500 multi hundreds of sensors or cameras will be looking at the object at the same time to provide an ID to provide an excellent imaging capability for, for clinical studies, general purpose clinical studies. So in this case, we have been uh, we have been particularly emphasized the capability of doing not only giving imaging, but also being able to separate gamma emissions from different isotope, for example, actinium 225, which is a popular alpha, alpha emitter for therapeutic purposes. And then in this case, there are clear need in terms of understanding the migration of not only actinium, but all its daughters within human body, within small animal. From there, we can extract so-called local toxicity, looking at the biocompatibility of this, this agent into for future therapeutic approach. So currently, there is no such system can separate those, those lines easily and then build up independent image for those isotopes. So that's one of the purpose of this development. To develop such a system to give you this type of energy resolution, you can kind of separate almost all the gamma ray emitters along this chain. As long as they're emitting gamma rays, we can separate those gamma rays with the system and build up multicolor uh, one image for one each individual isotope. So this is a the similar example, the similar sensor that we're going to use in the system that for reading two to three. And uh, this another half emitter. Uh, tip. So um, in this case, we can once again see the emission. This is uh, those peaks are color coded, so you can you can see the peaks not only from reading two to three, but uh, they stalters a number of the stalters at the same time. So therefore, we can build up their own distribution of those even individual parents and daughters at the same time between human body. So that would be that would be offering a unique imaging capability of better understanding target of therapy in the future. Okay, so with also all, all those capability, all those development in hand, we were start thinking about uh, if you have such, if the sensors are improving so much and not only give you the excellent speech resolution, but also the energy resolution and the sensitivity, we can potentially try to come back to revisit the counter camera. And we all know counter camera might have the, uh, the ability to, to give you a higher sensitivity, although it's just, which is a questionable, which is that uh, we need to be cautious on that aspect. So um, a number of pre -develop, previous development on Compton camera, one of the most noticeable is a C-Spring developed by people at the University of Michigan. And in this case, uh, they have a silicon detector in front of an entire gamma ray ring, the scintillation ring, to collect the scattered photons. And uh, this is a recent development coming from this Japanese group, a wonderful, wonderful development, putting two scintillation rings together, one out of the, outside of the other, the other one, and to facilitate gamma, gamma camera, um, Compton camera. Functionality. So they have been showing some. They have been showing not only the pet images but also the complex images of mouse or phantom and so on. 
Uh, one of the things I want to emphasize is that currently this study on only stop, stop at relatively high energy galleries while well, using high energy galleries for Thompson 909 KEV. So it would be important to see how it goes down to 500 KEV, 400 KEV range what's the, and what's the performance they offer there. So in our case, we have been developing this system that we have, uh, um, we're developing prototype system using those large area CGD sensors. And this is the actual configuration of the, of the system, we have a fold of the header panels placed in the, in the ring. And then this is the actual actual ring system. So this system can do coincidence and now we can use it for both pet imaging and content imaging. So what I'm showing at the bottom here, bottom right, is the, the actual pet image acquired with this system that we can achieve a 0 0.5, 0 0.75 millimeter speech resolution with the system in the pet mode. And also we can use the content to reject random coincidence and further improve the speech resolution. But interestingly, we can use the system for also for content imaging. But we're doing this in a slightly different context. We're talking about the so-called near field content imaging because the content imaging have a lot of limitation. It not only give you, it gave you the higher sensitivity, but that sensitivity does not directly translate to better image quality because each photon will carry less imaging information regarding the, the object. So we're talking about a relatively simple case that you put the object very close to your, your camera. In such a case, the angular uncertainty from detected um, content events will be translated into a smaller spatial uncertainty and therefore be able to give you a better spatial resolution. So what we're showing here is an example of having a point source, having point source being reconstructed using, using multiple, using simple back projection. And uh, on the right hand side, this is the actual ML-EM image that for multiple point source placed against a detector two centimeter away. And then you can, you can actually reconstruct a point source with a few hundred, few millimeters spatial resolution. Well, it's a three or four millimeter spatial resolution. So those are all ex experimental data. So these, those, uh, those sensors, this system and sensors, we further we develop a Monte Carlo modeling of the sensors and further explore the limit, limiting performance of the Compton, of the Compton kinematic for building on building on imaging images. So one of the our conclusion here is uh, if you use uh, for example showing at the very bottom left graph. So we have been incorporating incorporating different material, incorporating their practical speech resolution and resolution. Once you have done once you have done that, it turns out that those sensors will typically a sensor a compact sensor of two centimeter by two centimeter inside two centimeter thickness is capable of providing an angular uncertainty, angular accuracy of about three to four degrees. That translates to say two millimeter speech resolution about two millimeter speech resolution at a distance of two centimeter from the sensor. So in terms of near field content imaging using those of really compact CDD sensors, we might be able to achieve a speech resolution of a few millimeters in the future. And then a few other things is uh, for this near field content imaging, the speech resolution and energy resolution of the sensor becoming predominant. So the, the choice choice of material like CDT against saline bromide some material becoming less important. I mean, and therefore, which makes CCT uh, an interesting material for the for imaging gamma rays at say 400, 800 kV, which is of interest of for image alpha emitters and so on. So this is um, some exploration that we have in the lab in terms of exploring high resolution CCT sensors for content imaging as well. We have a lot of work to follow up to be presented in future meetings as well. Um, okay, so with all those, I've used one page for as a final remark. So over the past 10 years, 20 years, people have been um, working extensively improving the sensor, improving, improving the system design as well. I think we're very close to a stage that we will have in the very near future, have a clinical imaging system that not only give you, not only give you much improved speech resolution and the sensitivity, but at the same time, give you the energy resolution to approach a few KEV across a very wide, wide energy range, for example, uh, up to 600 kV, 700 kV, to from 30 kV to 600 kV. Therefore, we will be able to have this imaging system can separate all those gamma lines along this wide energy spectrum and then allow us to build up multicolor, multifunctional imaging, with spec imaging, with future spec imaging system at the same time. So it might be time to re rethink about our tracer strategy. How do we make use of this new cap this, uh, this capability of being able to image multiple tracers, therapeutic, therapeutic agents, uh, diagnosis agents at the same time to further enhance spec imaging in the future. Okay, so this is uh, this, this slide, I will I will stop here. I was very much thank, thanks for the, the support from NIBIB, NCI and other NHLBI and other funding agencies for supporting our work. And uh, thank you. And uh, any questions? Thank you, Tomang. Any questions?
George, what is your following of the? Um, I, I don't have any questions for Dr. Meng, but there are some questions that are still coming in for the previous speakers. So it looks like it takes time for people to conjure up a uh, question that they'd like to pose. So um, uh, hopefully uh, Dr. Meng will get a question or two um, in, in, the, in the next uh, few minutes, but um, bar none, uh, I think we can go to the next speaker. Okay, okay. that sounds great. Uh, so in this case, we're moving on to, uh, to the presentation by Dr. Todd Patterson. Uh, of Vanderbilt University. He will be talking about new camera design, imaging simulations, oh, simultaneously isotopes. So that's very attractive, very interesting. Okay, um, let's hear Dr. Todd Peterson. I'm happy to be talking with you today about new camera designs for multi-isotope imaging. Uh, disclaimer, and I have nothing to disclose. So the technology I'm going to be talking about today is high purity germanium detectors. Uh, germanium detectors have been known for a long time to be sort of the gold standard for gamma ray spectroscopy. Uh, there were first early attempts at using them for medical imaging back in the late 60s and early 1970s, but the technology was really sort of not up to snuff at that point in time and, and sort of left off. And in particular, the drawback uh, has always been the, the, the need for cryogenic temperatures, which uh, until recently required the use of liquid nitrogen. But over the last 15 or so years, there have been a lot of advances in contacts and cryogenics and electronics, uh, very much led by a company PHDS, or I'll just generally refer to them as PhDs in Knoxville, Tennessee, that have led to a new generation of uh, high purity germanium mechanically cooled double-sided strip detectors. So just to give you a really quick kind of uh, survey through the, the history of these position sensitive germanium detectors, uh, starting on the left, sort of both under the hood and what the entire setup looked like, starting on the left is sort of about the early 2000s. Uh, the middle pictures de depict sort of when we started first trying to do some medical imaging with these uh, back around 2009 or so of the first generation of mechanically cooled detectors. And soon after working with PhDs, we were able to sort of redesign the packaging uh, that you see over about 2010, 2011 to come up with a design that made it uh, a little bit easier to put a collimator on to use them for imaging. Shortly after that, under NIH SBIR uh, funding that we had together, we sort of evolved a, a new generation of something that really starts to look like a, a gamma camera, where we were able to outfit it with both um, parallel hole and pinhole collimators. And that's around 2013 or so. And, and then the most recent generation that sort of goes back to around 2017, 2018, is shown on the bottom right here, where importantly, that's all of the packaging. It's not only the germanium detector, but all of the electronics and the mechanical cooling as well. So just to give you a really quick sort of uh, look at the, the basic sort of format of what we've been using, the detectors, a standard that we've been using are 16 by 16 orthogonal strips with five millimeter strip pitch and a, a quarter millimeter uh, gap between the strips. And these are mechanically cooled, as I've mentioned. And so the great thing about uh, germanium detectors, uh, say in particular in, in comparison to cadmium zinc telluride detectors, is they have very good charge collection. And that allows us to get quite good uh, spatial resolution, even when using coarse strip pitch. And how that works is illustrated here, where if we have an incoming gamma ray that interacts, creates electron and hole pairs that drift towards the, the electrodes on each side, the charge collecting electrode obviously has a signal generated, but the design, we've designed these detectors such that we're able to sense the fast transient pulses that are induced on the neighboring electrodes during the, the charge collection time. And so by comparing the size of those two uh, signals, uh, fast transient signals, uh, in comparison to the size of the signal uh, generated with the charge collecting uh, electrode, we're able to get into substrip uh, position interpolation, and right now we get about 1.5 millimeter full width half max. Depth of interaction, we're able to estimate quite straightforwardly just based on the difference in charge collection times between the two sides. Of course, as I started by saying, energy resolution is the, the key sort of benefit of germanium detectors, and how does that benefit us in imaging? Well, obviously, with better energy resolution, we can have better scatter rejection, 
and also reduced crosstalk if we have uh, photo peaks that are near one another. So the illustration shown here is really just trying to show that the two most commonly radio used radionuclides in conventional uh, clinical spec imaging and research spec, technetium-99 and I-123, where you worry not only about uh, downscatter from the I-123 into the technetium window, but in fact, in conventional sodium iodide cameras, the photo peaks often overlap. So to illustrate the differences with the germanium detectors that we've been using, I show on the top just a uh, cobalt-57 uh, pulse height spectrum using a sodium iodide camera, the nanospect uh, system that we have in our lab, has just a little slightly better than 10% full at half max at 122 keV. Uh, down below, I show our high purity germanium detectors where we have four different radionuclides present and showing the six different gamma ray lines. And in particular, I draw your attention to the fact that uh, whereas the sodium iodide, you can't really fully resolve the 136 keV peak from the 122 keV in 50, cobalt 57. In fact, with germanium, we can distinguish the 136 from the 140 of technetium 99M. So once we got into doing this imaging, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but just to illustrate our, our earliest sort of foray into uh, equipping these for SPECT is a single pinhole camera that we mounted onto a microcat uh, X-ray CT gantry. And so because it was a single pinhole camera, not a uh, great state of the art by any means in terms of the sensitivity and spatial resolution, but importantly, what we were able to demonstrate using this system was the multi-isotope capabilities. Uh, so what we did here was, again, using the Bioscan Nanospect as a commercial system that, that uh, is designed, in fact, for as software for doing multi-isotope imaging, we did a direct comparison where we used every sort of combination of syringes of technetium-99M and iodine-123, imaging them together and in both individually. And what you can see is uh, with the germanium detector, we're able to set far narrower energy windows around those photo peaks and uh, show, in fact, one of the pulse height spectra for one of the experiments uh, for the germanium detector in the bottom left. And so if we look at the crosstalk ratios that we see in the respective energy windows, uh, you can see whereas the, the uh, I-123 spills appreciably into the photo peak window for technetium-99M with a sodium iodide camera, uh, we have much less cross-contamination in, in the germanium spec. Uh, and I should point out, then we went on to do SPECT imaging with these using, in fact, the uh, crosstalk correction algorithm that the NanoSpec system has. And when you image the two radionuclides together uh, and reconstruct the separate images, uh, what you can actually see in the NanoSpec case, even after crosstalk correction, is you still have a, a faint hint of the iodine-123 syringe in, showing up in the technetium image. Uh, this is better illustrated when we do just imaging iodine-123 alone and when we reconstruct what is present in the technetium-99M window, you can see it present in the nanospec, whereas it's easy to eliminate that in the germanium detector. Well, so turning to the, the main sort of uh, topic of this workshop, which is imaging of therapeutic radionuclides, uh, obviously in targeted alpha therapy, We'd like to do imaging, particularly with some of these uh, radionuclides that have complicated decay schemes, where there might be the case that after the decay of the initial uh, radionuclide that was used to label the agent, that the uh, progeny it sort of comes unhinged from the targeting moiety and then may redistribute in the body. So say there are uh, uh, actinium-225 uh, is one of the uh, radionuclides, it's generated a lot of interest in alpha imaging, and it has a complicated decay scheme where there are a few gamma rays along the way that we are capable of imaging. So I haven't had access to any of these therapeutic radionuclides in, in my laboratory yet, but I'd like to share some data that was collected by PhDs uh, over at Oak Ridge National Lab, where this is doing planar pinhole imaging uh, of uh, some uh, radionuclide nuclide sample inside of a, a chemistry hood. So that's what you see with the image. The uh, detector results I'll show are equipped with a camera for, for these, uh, this particular type of detector. And what you see on the left is a uh, pulse height spectrum uh, shown in, in log scale, importantly, where you can see a number of peaks uh, from the different members of the decay scheme are uh, highlighted there. So what this looks like is uh, very, fairly similar to that latest generation uh, camera that I'd shown you before, 
Uh, it's equipped on a mechanism where you can both have a, a pinhole collimator on it and have an arm that you can move to position to do the imaging, actually set it up to, in fact, even look over someone's shoulder. And it has a camera mounted on it that allows you to overlay the uh, image from the uh, uh, gamma ray image on the visual image as well. So here showing is the collection carousel in doing chemical separation where you can see the 99.8 keV image from uh, actinium-225, radium-225 image at 40 keV, francium-221 at 218 keV, and bismuth-213 at 440 keV, and finally, the thallium-209 at 465 keV. So all collected simultaneously. So the challenges in imaging of therapeutic radionuclides that we have to deal with when we think about trying to turn this technology into a practical SPECT system uh, is the even greater than usual demand on, in SPECT on uh, having good sensitivity. This is because the administered doses are often very small, uh, generally less than two millicuries. And in many of these radionuclides, the gamma rays that do exist have fairly small branching ratios. Uh, also, many of the emissions in radionuclides of interest are, are actually quite high energy, which makes collimation a challenge. Of course, the detection efficiency also decreases as you go up in energy. Uh, and as you go up in energy as well, particularly in germanium, Compton scattering dominates in the interactions that you do have in your detector. So this may lead us to uh, want to consider a Compton camera or some sort of Compton enhanced imaging. And interestingly, these detectors, the germanium detectors and the, and the pulse processing electronics that they have uh, developed are actually capable of acting in a Compton camera uh, mode. So. Uh, again, Compton cameras, as uh, I believe was discussed uh, previously uh, by Ling John Meng, what you're doing is you're doing a, a, a two interaction sort of experiment where you have an initial scattering in, in a first sort of place in the detector, and then the Compton scattered photon is subsequently absorbed. And if you make energy and position measurements on both of those interactions, you can reconstruct to within a, a kinematic cone uh, where that the line that the gamma ray entered your detector along. So what you're able to do in these germanium detectors is actually process the two interactions occurring within the single crystal. And so what I've shown at the bottom is a, an experiment that was conducted using three different point sources, barium-133, cesium-137, and looking at the 511 keV emission from uh, sodium-22. And you can see the pulse height spectrum, so see those gamma ray lines on, on the bottom left. And just doing Compton camera imaging in each of the energy channels uh, you're able to locate in, in space where those point sources uh, were. Now, of course, these still suffer from the general challenges of any Compton camera in terms of dealing with uh, imaging of, of near field distributed sources that are much harder challenging, uh, harder task than uh, imaging distant point sources. So where are we at? We're uh, still undergoing a number of developments, including working on a dual head spec prototype where we have two single pinhole cameras. The focus right now on that system is, is doing dual tracer brain spec in non-human primates. Uh, we are also working on increasing the operating temperature. So if we uh, increase the operating temperature of the mechanical cooling, that will reduce our power consumption. It also slows the charge collection, which we hope may improve spatial resolution. Uh, showing briefly some data comparing operation of a, a test detector, both 85 Kelvin and 105 Kelvin, where the charge collection is slowed down by 20% at the higher temperature. And so the idea is by being able to get more samples of these transient waveforms, we may be able to improve the uh, substrip interpolation. Uh, we're also working on improving, uh, continuing to improve the fabrication methods. Uh, recently, PhDs has gone towards uh, doing uh, flat cuts instead of circular detectors, where it's sort of less handling and, and simpler sort of, or more gentle sort of processing of the detectors, increase the fabrication yield and give given better temperature tolerance. Uh, and this gives us good hope that we might be able to move towards larger diameter detectors as well. We've made some uh, under that SBIR funding I mentioned previously. We did make some larger detectors, but uh, there are some differences that were difficult to deal with at the time. And so we're hopeful that with this new approach that we may be able to uh, fabricate detectors that, that are of high quality. So in my last few uh, seconds here, I'd like to acknowledge this has been, uh, we've been working with these germanium detectors in a collaboration with PhDs for about 12 years now, uh, with using a variety of funding sources. 
and a variety of uh, scientists have worked with me in my lab. Their pictures are shown there, Lindsay Oleg, Desmond Rose, Andrew and Seppi. And also like to give a big shout out to Ethan Hull, and of course, who leads PhDs as well as Matthew Kaiser and, and all of the other folks who have worked with at, at PhDs. And I uh, think this technology has a lot of potential and I look forward to uh, having opportunity to try to work more and more focused way in imaging, using the technology to image therapeutic radionuclides. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, Todd, he's right there. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, we, we, uh, we do actually have some quick questions for uh, Dr. Peterson. Uh, and we Dr. have time for questions too. Yeah, so, it's yeah, so we're a little, we're a little ahead. So, um, so Todd, uh, please describe uh, dead time from your detectors and electronics and how far you can push it. How far can we push it? Well, uh, so one of the things is we're, we're using, you know, flash ADCs and reading out all of these uh, strips on these detectors simultaneously and then doing really the pulse processing uh, in, in sort of FPGAs. And that, that gives us pretty good throughput and lowers the dead time. It depends a little bit on sort of what uh, mode you're operating in, but certainly easily uh, tens of, of kilohertz sort of rate capability with minimal dead time is possible. I believe there's one configuration that PHE has operated in where they went all the way up to about 100 kilohertz uh, capability with the sort of minimal degradation of performance. Uh, there's another uh, quick question here that uh, we could probably take care of now, and that is um, uh, William Hunter is uh, thanking you for an excellent talk and wondering if the temporal resolution is enough to distinguish both photons of a Compton event in the same crystal? Yes, so in, in fact, uh, I probably started typing that question before I got to the end of the talk there, because in fact, that was what was demonstrated in near, near the end. So in fact, you can uh, distinguish uh, multiple hits uh, in, inside of the detector. So you can have both the first uh, Compton scatter and then the subsequent absorption event and, and measure those separately and actually reconstruct the positions uh, independently. Now, there are obviously a few places where they'll be compromised in performance based on sort of the, the distance that the Compton scattered photon uh, travels, uh, but there, that's just a matter of doing the event selection uh, properly. So yes, it's definitely uh, possible. Okay, uh, those are all the questions for Dr. Peterson. There may be some more by the time we get to the panel discussion. So Yasek, uh, I think we can get a little, a little ahead of schedule and go on to uh, uh, the next presentation. Absolutely, and that's what we do. So Good. next presentation, <laughs> next pre presentation by, is by Dr. Lars uh, Foreign Lind, and he will be talking about the, multi-technology approach to alpha particle emitting isotope imaging. It's very close to my heart, so I'm looking forward to this presentation. Please. So it's a pleasure to be here um, to discuss a, an approach to, that we call multi-technology um, to the problem of imaging alpha emitting radioisotopes and their progeny. Uh, before I get started, here's my disclosure slide. Um, and I'll start by saying that this is uh, work uh, and ideas developed in a, um, with ourselves at the University of Arizona in collaboration with um, John Hum at the Memorial Sloan Kettering and um, Professor Tad Takahashi at the University of Tokyo in, in Japan. So the motivations for imaging in particular in targeted alpha particle therapy is uh, well known to um, the attendees of this workshop. I'll summarize very quickly. Um, of course, the big advantage is that you can target individual cells as well as tumor masses. The targeting uh, moieties can range from small molecules to antibodies, so you can reach a wide variety of tissues. Um, it's applicable to um, multifocal disease. And most importantly, the alpha particles are, of course, very efficient at delivery of uh, cell lethal energies in very small volumes, maximizing therapeutic effect while minimizing surrounding tissue damage. Some of the challenges that have to be considered are the fact that radiopharmaceutical that isn't taken up by the target can accumulate in the organs associated with clearance, for example, the kidney or liver. Um, in the act of, an, of the emission of the alpha particle, uh, there will be a recoil effect as well as a transmutation of the isotope, um, which may lead to the dissociation from the carrier molecule and translocation to other tissues or organs. 
and the subsequent decays of the progeny may then deliver additional non-beneficial dose before being cleared into, um, into other tissues. So the primary purposes of imaging in support of alpha, um, targeted alpha particle therapy is really to um, characterize the dose delivery to the desired tissue target um, for establishing um, therapeutic protocols, um, to assess the unintended or undesired dose delivery that's to sensitive organs, and furthermore, um, especially in preclinical models, um, to resolve the uptake in the organ substructures, for example, looking in particularly at the cortex and the kidney, um, when it's not enough just to characterize the amount, total amount in the organ. Um, there are a variety of alpha emitters that are of interest, but for the rest of this talk, I'm actually going to focus primarily on um, actinium-225. It actually has a, um, a, um, a little bit of a complicated decay scheme, uh, passing through a, um, a number of uh, progeny isotopes um, that contribute to the therapeutic effect um, by also emitting alpha particles if they stay put. Um, there's a total delivery of four alpha particles per actinium before the decay is complete. Um, there are really three imageable um, gammas in, in um, an actinium-225 itself. Unfortunately, the yield is very low at 1%, um, around 100 keV. Um, there's a Francis 221 has a gamma at 218 with decent yield. Um, and of course, Business 213 has a gamma at 440 um, with even better yield. Um, the actual photon emissions from, um, from actinium-225 are more complicated than that, though. Um, they include, in addition to the main gamma ray emissions, a, a whole host of characteristic X-rays uh, down around uh, between 100 and 200 keV range. Um, there's also uh, Bremsstrahl and background present from um, additional um, beta emissions um, occurring in some of the progeny isotopes. So the complete spectrum is um, is actually quite a bit more complicated. Um, uh, there is even some Cherenkov, although that's down, of course, uh, far off the um, X-ray and gamma ray energy scales. Um, but the main uh, takeaway from this is that if you set energy windows um, for in a traditional SPECT approach tightly around the principle of gamma emissions, you will actually be able to throw away most of the photons emitted uh, from the sample that could potentially be used for imaging. Um, what we're after in preclinical imaging model is, um, is uh, something that, that looks as close to this as we can. So this is actually a technology developed at um, University of Arizona um, that we'll describe a little bit more about in a few slides down the line. Um, but it implements an alpha particle counting digital audio radiography system. Um, this is mouse kidney um, with um, following uptake from, of an actinium-225 dose. Um, this is actually imaging of the alphas um, themselves. Um, and you can actually clearly see here the distribution of the dose is concentrated in the cortex um, the tubules around the perimeter of the kidney. And this is also where there's most sensitivity to the dose and where you want to worry about um, trying to avoid uh, renal impairment. So as the title suggests, we've been working um, at the University of Arizona over a program of uh, spanning more than 25 years in developing um, different camera technologies for uh, imaging gamma rays, uh, principally for SPECT applications. Um, these have been both uh, semiconductor based as well as scintillator based and occurring in parallel. Um, and our most current generation of systems, the most capable detector technologies we have um, include um, sort of what we're calling a third generation cross strip cadmium telluride detectors um, actually developed um, by the Takahashi group at Ipmu in Japan. Um, an in house new developed hybrid uh, PMTS IPM scintillation camera. Um, as well as a Gen 3 large area version of the iKid camera that I mentioned earlier, um, which will also image gammas. The one thing that we've learned, and it's pretty much characteristic of um, the detector technologies, semiconductors based on CAD telluride or CAD zinc telluride versus modular cameras versus um, the iKid cameras, um, is they excel in some um, properties, um, but have some weaknesses in some others. Um, the CAD telluride properties are and CAT CGTs um, tend to be outstanding in spatial resolution and energy resolution and very good in stopping power. Hard to make um, large area and, um, and have somewhat modest count rate capabilities um, for preclinical applications. Uh, modular gamma cameras have um, good spatial and energy resolution, um, but they can be made outstanding in terms of stopping power with the right scintillator and count rate capabilities, and they can be made very large, so you can work at large magnifications. 
Um, the iKid cameras um, have the best spatial resolution of any of these, can be made large, at least for a preclinical camera scale, um, but have um, very poor energy resolution and modest um, stopping power. So the real question is, if you can't get all the attributes uh, packed into a single detector technology, is there anything you can do combining the two or three um, in the same detector system? Um, and this is um, some mathematics worked out by Eric Clarkson in our group um, using the, um, the fairly common image uh, science figure of merit, um, which is uh, lesion detectability um, as calculated by using a hoteling observer. And um, Dr. Skopinski and Clarkson worked out the expression for the detectability in a two camera system um, where the two, two, two cameras, which may have different detector technologies as well as different collimation um, techniques, um, you end up with, in the case that the systems are not identical, you end up with um, an overall detectability that is indeed the sum of the individual detectabilities. Um, but then there are some synergy terms, some cross uh, terms that can either enhance or um, diminish the overall detectability. And even though it looks with the minus signs here, like it's always diminishing the detectability, the truth is if the information given by the two detectors is complementary, um, then in fact, the, the terms in here can be, actually be negative in such a way that you enhance detectability um, with two different technologies over what you can achieve with a single detector technology. This is something that we presented in that paper. IEEE in uh, 2019, that's in the conference proceedings. Um, similar types of um, breakdowns occur when we move to different tasks, including um, estimation tasks. Um, you often end up with um, synergy terms that you can, um, if you design the system properly, can make work in your favor to enhance the performance. Um, so a little bit about the detector technologies we're working with. I mentioned the um, double-sided strip detectors from the um, Takahashi group in Japan. These are cross strip detectors um, where, um, where there is a, um, you gain the benefit of a very efficient readout of the strips to give you a very large number of um, effective pixels. Um, we worked with these devices and characterized this performance um, with, um, with um, at Argonne National Laboratory at the synchrotron. Um, and they really are, um, provide a truly remarkable energy resolution measured at 0.7%. 0.8% at 130 keV, um, really driving home their excellent uh, energy and spatial resolution. Um, one of the keys to maintaining strong spatial resolution um, to get to the best possible uh, final resolution in preclinical imaging is, particularly if you're imaging with pinholes, you need to worry about parallax effects and avoiding them means doing depth of interaction estimation. Um, this is work by graduate students um, and now graduated Dr. Essence Alcine um, from our group. Um, who was able to um, figure out how to do maximum likelihood estimation of depth of interaction so that you could resolve a slant beam passing through a three quarter millimeter thick. Um, um, this was a, a, a Gen 1 um, cadmium, zinc tellur cadmium telluride cross strip detector from the Takahashi group. Uh, the final depth um, resolution is on the order of 20 to 40 microns. Uh, it actually varies a little bit through the detector and there's a reason why it's so important to get go out and get strong um, calibration data for figuring out um, to get the best um, performance out of your detector technologies. The iKid system, if you haven't um, been exposed to it before, is actually pretty interesting. It uses stru structured scintillator and optical gain in the form of an image intensifier. Um, then the readout, the optical readout is with a fast frame um, CMOS camera. And what you see in the frames that are cycling through is each one of these frames contains on the order of 25 to 40 um, individual gamma ray events occurring on the face of the scintillator. Um, and the thing about iKid is that you are um, imaging the um, light as emitted um, from the scintillation event before it has a chance to, um, to expand out. So you're actually seeing images of the scintillation light as it's created in the structured scintillator. Um, you then do some processing on that to extract from these individual um, images of scintillation event, um, you process to ex um, estimate the centroid position. Um, when you're done with that, um, what you can get is a, um, the best spatial resolution that we know of for gamma ray imaging, um, gets you to about 25 micron resolution um, at megapixel um, frame sizes so that you, um, you can get some remarkable um, data from this. Um, a way to, um, to really illustrate that is that a fraction of the events 
that occur in the scintillator, of course, will uh, involve a, a movement of um, generation of movement of some fraction of the energy as a secondary K X ray that gets reabsorbed. And indeed, you start seeing in these frames that a, a fraction of the primary interaction events are associated with what I would call a moon um, circulating around it, which is actually the site of a reabsorbed um, K X ray. I don't know of any other detector technology that can resolve those as separate events. Um, the other technology that we're working with is a, is a um, what I would call a next generation modular simulation camera. So if we think about the anger camera as a, um, as a simulator, um, a light guide and an array of light sensors reading it out, um, then where the modern um, simulation camera has emerged to is, um, is being able to augment uh, conventional PMTs, which are inexpensive and actually perform very well. Um, but you can augment them with uh, silicon photomultiplier versions, and particularly in our application, giving us more uh, fine light sensing out around the perimeter of the crystal, giving us a, a true um, high performance, high resolution imaging all the way out to the very edge of the crystal. Um, we also, because of the increase in the number of light sensors, are able to do um, 3D spatial resolution, and our simulations suggest um, we'll have a, a final resolution on the order of one by one by two millimeters in depth on a seven inch by seven inch um, by eight millimeter thick detector line. We can go thicker for high energy applications. We can switch to cesium iodide from sodium iodide to increase the, um, the um, stopping power with no problem. So what I'd like to do is, um, is really to uh, talk about, you know, to draw from this some, some conclusions about where there's opportunities or we see opportunities for fundamental advancements in Spect imaging of um, alpha emitters. Um, the one thing I'd love that um, we really like to point out is that there's still lots of development to do in image science in the developing the theory and the mathematics. Um, th there is almost always a formal analysis method, and in the example I show you, um, that the detectability metric allows itself to be expanded to consider the possibility of, um, of multiple detector technologies imaging the same system at the same time and gaining a benefit, the theoretical basis is there. But more theory um, is there to be developed and to guide the systems and to guide the hardware development so it doesn't just become a trial and error process. Um, obviously, the, the, the observers uh, and estimators needed to handle um, the data that comes from um, spec systems at these, um, of, from the alpha emitters um, need to consider their complicated uh, spectrum um, that's being emitted. And indeed, uh, there's a need for spectrum aware reconstruction methods um, that, that go beyond um, simple windowed uh, acquisitions. In the detectors, where there's always a need for large area high Z semiconductor detectors, um, as well as incinerators um, moving towards higher Z, better stopping power for the high energy photons. And as always, highlight output is really the key um, metric that shows up in all. Um, estimates of um, system performance. Um, there's a need to investigate large area gases or solid state electron multipliers to support larger versions of detectors, such as the iKID. Um, and SIPMs, as interesting and as applicable they are, there's still room for improvement, reduced backgrounds, uh, reduced after pulsing effects, et cetera. The detectors themselves are not enough for imaging. Um, there's a great opportunities for um, improvements and developments in fabrication methods and materials and calibration methods related to producing collimators. We're making very heavy use of uh, rapid prototype um, printed uh, structures for our imaging collimators. Um, there's also um, a very strong need for real-time system simulation, both for um, predicting performance, um, but also for supporting calibration. And indeed, there's a great opportunity for physics aware um, machine learning or AI methods in making for rapid and convenient calibration systems. Um, I'd like to acknowledge um, the grant support that has led for the investigations uh, for some of the items and developments shown in this talk. And with that, I'd like to um, thank you and I'd be happy to respond to any questions. It was great, pre great presentation and good to have uh, Lars on live right here. But I, I think that since we're moving on to the panel discussion, George, what do you think? Maybe we should go to panel discussion and address all the questions at the same yes. time. Uh, yeah, so, so some questions for individual speakers came after the speakers finished. Uh, right. And so I think in, in fairness, uh, we could start with those questions first uh, and then go through to the more uh, recent uh, talks that were given. Okay. So if we could ask all of the uh, speakers and panelists to 
kind of put their videos on, I think we right. can step, step through this. So we're officially um, moving to the panel discussion right now. Yes, I think we can do that. We're again, a little ahead of time, but uh, given the number of questions and interesting discussions we've had before, I'm sure we will fill the time. So um, Ben, uh, I see that you're on. First question to you is, um, it's a long one. I don't know if you want to turn on your QA box uh, to, to read along, but the question from Spencer Manuel is, quantitative spec is not currently widespread, he says. Uh, yet uh, dosimetry is still performed, for example, using planar images where signal, single, simple normalization factors are used to uh, correlate total counts in a whole body planar image to the administered activity. Can you please comment on the current, on the current level of accuracy and precision that can be achieved in dose estimates using these simple methods in the absence of robust quantitative spec. What level of improvement might you expect with the use of quantitative spec image data? So let me understand the question. So if, if I understand it correctly, is that is a simple quantitative spec method can achieve, at what level of accuracy can simple quantitative spec method is that, is that the question? Compared to a more sophisticated uh, quantitative aspect method. Uh, I think they're, they're asking, um, uh, since uh, dosimetry is still performed using planar images, right. where normalization factor is correlated with counts, um, can you comment on the uh, level of accuracy and pre uh, precision could be uh, achieved using these simple methods where uh, the, uh, in the absence of robust co uh, quantitative spec? Well, I mean, um, the reason if I understand why spec is not very frequently used in dosimetry calculation is because it takes more time. Because of the instrumentation, you have dual camera, you have rotate. So in order to do a quick quantitation, especially you want to track it as a function of time, it's very hard to do, it's very costly to do uh, a spec. First of all, you take more um, imaging, it costs more time and it also costs more um, a cost. But in a simple like a, a dual camera, like a geometric mean, that type of method is relatively simple. I mean, you can just, you know, measure it and then you can um, you can do multiple as a function of time. So if you have a, if you have a single camera, I think the accuracy is fairly low because of the activity depending on the depth of the source. If, if you only have one camera, it's very hard to, to estimate the, uh, the depth of the source. And, and if that's the case, then it's very hard to calculate, for instance, the attenuation effect. If you have two camera, then you can use a geometric mean method. Then you can get fairly more accurate quantitation if you have a single source. But if you have a two sources overlapping each other, then you still have a problem of getting the quantitative accuracy of the individual source. Many years ago, when the geometric mean first came about, so I thought that was a pretty good method then you, I try to, for instance, if you have an overlapping source, what do you do? It's still a problem, okay? So, so I think that if you ask me, uh, what is the relatively quantit quantit uh, uh, accuracy? I think it depending on the method, for instance, single camera, dual camera, or spec camera, and also the source distribution. If a single source is much easier, when you have two sources overlapping, it's harder. When you have even more than a, um, if you have a source distribution uh, um, of more complicated source distribution, I think a planar method, you're going to have a lot of error. Does that answer your question? I, I believe so. Like I said, it was, it was a long question, but I, I, I think your uh, insights uh, uh, on, on that issue were, uh, were appropriate. So thank you. 
uh, there is a, um, a second uh, uh, question from uh, William Warstel, who says, uh, attenuation correction in the linear system theory that you described seems like it would get the best quantitative accuracy using a dual energy CT, spectral CT, so that you could then scale the Compton and photocap capture attenuation to whatever your spec isotope is. So one uh, should say that uh, and I guess this is the question, uh, SPEC might have an opportunity to be the most quantitatively accurate if its CT is high end. Do you agree? Well, if you use a high end CT and you have higher accuracy, correct, okay? And you have less noise, I think you get a better reconstruction, okay? And I think for in that sense, I think it is better. But, but don't forget, when you, you do a spec CT, when you want to use a CT for attenuation correction, you have to convert the CT number to attenuation coefficient, okay? For that particular energy you use in mission scan, okay? So that is a, um, it's one of the early problem. I think even Townsend, you know, refer to the paper that we first published about how to convert the CT uh, number, okay, to the attenuation coefficient of that energy that you use in mission scan, okay? So for even for the high-end CT, you still have to make that um, trans conversion. I think earlier there's a question about dual energy CT, correct? Spectral CT, dual energy. Spectral yeah. CT. Now that's a little bit more complicated now. So now you have to be very careful in your conversion. Okay, in the conversion from a CT number to the appropriate attenuation coefficient, there's actually is not a linear curve; it's a biphasic curve. Okay, depending on the energy, there's a, there's a certain calibration of that particular spectrum of CT. If you're multi-spectrum CT, then you have to talk about the CT image you got is which part of the spectral CT. Then you have to do the appropriate correction. Okay, I think that is something that um, we can refer to the paper if you if he's, he's interested. Yep. Okay, um, there are actually uh, a few questions for Eric who is not uh, attending. Um, so, uh, uh, ben, maybe you could uh, chime in on these. Sure, uh, <laughs> you, you work uh, closely together. Um, uh, so for Eric's talk, how quantitatively accurate is SPECT reconstruction for the very noisy image data produced by alpha emitting radionuclides, such as actinium-225 and thorium-237? This was asked by John Hum. Well, once you get into that very high energy photon, I think it's getting very difficult. I kind of mentioned, described a little bit about uh, using uh, medium and high energy um, collimator and the medium high energy photons to do, um, to, to do a quantitation. One of the problem with those um, high energy photon and high energy collimator is that the point response function of the collimator is very messy. Okay, some of them you see the whole pattern, some of them you see a, um, a star pattern that um, reflect the hexagonal whole configuration of a collimator. If you do the reconstruction without taking care of that, what you see is a, a lot of artifacts. I think I showed that slide very quickly, and I guess because of uh, put a lot of material in, you don't see the artifact as much. So also you get a lot of noise, okay, in those in those images because of the count is relatively low because of the source and also because of the energy, the medium and high energy collimator are mm -hmm. fairly inefficient. So the example I use, which is published book chapters and publication, is that when you model the response function, including like the whole pattern like the, the, the whole pattern and the star pattern into the, um, the iterative 
statistical iterative reconstruction. And the amazing thing you found in the example that we use at least up to 300, up to the IDA 130, 131 example we use. Amazingly, the whole pattern artifact go away. Okay. At the same time, because of the uh, because of the uh, special uh, detector response correction, as I mentioned in my talk, when we start to do, um, I'm sorry, the collimator detector response, we thought that we were only going to sharpen the image, means to recover the resolution. What astonished to us, was surprised to us, it also substantially reduced the noise. I think this is very, very interesting because as, as you know, we all study linear system. Okay, when you, when the teacher show you image processing, when you want to reduce noise, usually, or most of the case, okay, almost exclusively, okay, you will smooth the image. The same thing is called no free lunch, okay? But in our case, we actually very surprised to find that when we sharpen the noise with the detector response, we also substantially reduce the noise. Okay, a lot of people think iterative reconstruction, you can reduce the noise, which is not true. The really um, effect of reducing the noise is the modeling of the detector response. Now, that's a very interesting, I think after we talk about it, nobody believed that, but I think there are a lot of publication afterward showing the same phenomena. So I think that what I'm saying is that when you go to a high energy, first of all, as uh, some speaker mentioned before, we need to have a good uh, high energy collimator. Okay, I think that is something that we don't have yet. I think we need to design collimator with, uh, for that kind of energy. For instance, denser material, tungsten, maybe even you know, radium, okay? And um, so you need to have very dense material to have uh, allow you to have low, thinner scepter, still thick, but thinner, to allow you to have right, high resolution and also with low scepter. You two will have some, and you combine with the uh, iterative reconstruction with statistic modeling that I was talking about, then I think you have a, a, some possibility of getting better quantitation. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there are- I actually, uh, if I can just add to that, I have the benefit of having a slide so I can, I can give some numbers on that. So for- for radium 223 uh, in realistic uh, geometries, for example, small intestine, uh, at about four hours, the it's uh, uh, uncertainty of around 3.8 uh, plus or minus 0.6 percent. So, uh, good accuracy and really good precision at a, at about uh, 144 hours for radium 223. If you look at bone, it's about 13 percent plus or minus 1 percent. Again, really good accuracy and, and good precision. For the thorium radium uh, dual imaging, um, I think bottom line is that it's feasible within 10 to 15 percent for for organ-sized objects. When you get to small tumors, the answer, the uh, accuracy goes down and precision is becomes more susceptible to noise. So that's kind of the ballpark with with these high-tech uh, reconstruction uh, techniques. Okay, Thanks. thank you. Thanks, George. Yep. Were you raising your hand, John? Or were you? I was just thanking the two, the two, uh, okay. George and Ben for a very okay. good answer. Okay, thank, thank you for your questions. Um, I have two questions here for uh, Todd and Lars. So uh, let's go to those next. And then uh, we have a general question, which I think could uh, open things up for uh, interesting discussions. Uh, I assume that this is for Todd. Um, it, great system, great technology. Does the fa fantastic energy resolution help? It must uh, for quantitation of the scatter uh, accuracy, as well as giving you great multi-isotope capability. So uh, can you uh, quantitate scatter much better with the uh, resolution of germanium cameras? 
Yeah, it's an interesting point. I mean, I think the you know the obvious piece is the narrow energy window that you can set allows you to uh, sort of exclude scatter from your photo peak that you're going to reconstruct. But I think an interesting uh, aspect is that with the outstanding energy resolution, the scattered photons actually contain information themselves in a sense. You know, there have been several people uh, most recently, I know Avinav Jha's group at uh, WashU have been looking at trying to, you know, look at the scatter information that's contained in the scatter and possibly do uh, not only scatter correction, but attenuation correction based on that sort of uh, content out in the scatter tail. And so with uh, sort of outstanding energy resolution that insofar as those sort of schemes have some merit to them, uh, I think that the energy resolution definitely is a benefit in, in that scenario. Right. Okay, and uh, for Lars, I believe there are two questions here. Um, the first one, uh, for your uh, synergy term, does it take spatial frequency, the Wiener spectrum, et cetera, into account when combining your technologies? For example, is that a particular advantage when combining technologies with different characteristics for SPECT? So I think you can think of the um, synergy terms as um, containing not only um, possibly different um, spatial frequencies, that is essentially spatial resolution, um, but also energy spectra, uh, sensitivities, field of view. You can, you can look at um, combinations of data and uh, the mathematics permits the possibility that you are better off um, with a combination of two uh, detector technologies collimation strategies um, with division, you know, with, with um, acquisition times divided between them um, in such a way that you are better off than you could accomplish um, with either technology or imaging configuration on its own. It is something that um, was explored by um, a former graduate student in his dissertation who worked with Matt Kapinski. Um, um, who indeed found that um, you found improved task performance with combinations of imaging approaches um, as opposed to hitting it with a um, just a single approach and trying to collect longer, for example. So the, the appearance of the synergy terms um, I, we consider opens up uh, the, the, the theoretical possibility uh, that would be very, very interesting to explore. Hey, uh, you have a second question here, uh, and then I think um, Dr. Mioka has a question, and then we'll return to uh, an interesting question from uh, Dr. Hum. Uh, so Lars, you spoke of a need for reconstruction techniques. Um, Larry Pierce has heard uh, the phrase, reconstruction is a solved problem. Many times over the past 10 years from some leaders in the community, do you think this inhibits funding for reconstruction research? Kind um, of a funding question here. Yeah, <laughs> but interesting. Uh, well, I, I guess I'll make a um, kind of a comment that represents, uh, you know, my own opinion and um, but it's just that I don't have data to back it up, but it's a little bit tricky right now to get uh, funding related to purely theoretical developments. Everything uh, at this point kind of, it's easier if you want to do a development in, in a reconstruction, you almost have to hang it on to the development of a new system and be able to show, you know, that it's necessary for that system. So there is, uh, there is challenges right now in, uh, in um, some of the groundwork. And I think the, um, uh, the alpha emitter um, imaging problems that we've heard described by virtually all of the speakers, some of the challenges, I think, is particularly uh, in need of some uh, more sophisticated reconstruction methods, what I called spectrum aware, as opposed to um, trying to divide the problem up into uh, a couple of monochromatic or essentially monochromatic um, reconstruction problems working in tandem. Hey, thank you, Lars. Uh, Robert, I see your hand is raised. Yes, I, I actually had two questions, and it, I, I, I hope I can ask one to George because um, he he said organ-based um, 
kind of dosimetry might be good enough, but for alpha emitters, is organ base going to be good enough or do we need to have it more, um, more, you know, localized in the organs? It seems like um, the micro dosimetry is, is quite important. And so um, maybe a comment there. And then I kind of a follow on to Lars's comments, um, kind of going to more spectral base reconstruction because even with that really amazing energy resolution, some of these peaks are sitting on some pretty high pedestals. Um, and so in a, I'm assuming we're seeing kind of global energy spectra being, you know, that, that's being shown. And I don't know if there's, if these are objects in air or what. So um, maybe any comments on that would be appreciated. So I, I'm assuming you meant uh, George S instead of George C. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, I'm yeah, sorry, George S. Yes, George. I hear George a lot. Yes. So I'm, I'm just moderating. You're answering, George. Okay. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a fantastic question. And absolutely, with, with these short range alpha emitters, uh, you need to have a way to convert the ma macroscopic measurement you can make in a human to sort of uh, to the microscopic realm. I mean, it's, it's something that uh, we're working at here at Hopkins, uh, uh, taking the approach of pairing uh, preclinical uh, uh, biodistribution of agents. So if you, if you take, um, uh, if you take, if you think of doing, if you think of doing a study, let's say in a mouse or, or, a, or a pig or a dog, you can take the whole organ activity and then you can go into the kind of detail that, that uh, John Hum showed and, and get the distribution of that whole organ activity to its microscale distribution by, by various methods, alpha camera imaging, um, uh, autoradiography. And that then provides, I, I'm kind of describing uh, sort of a technique that uh, uh, in particular Rob Hobbs uh, uh, published a while ago for, for, the, for the kidneys. Um, so basically, you take the whole organ activity, and in, in one species, you can measure it both at the macro scale and at the micro scale. And if you, so then you, you invoke the assumption that uh, the species are uh, mammalian and, and kind of, you might expect to have the similar behavior. You have to correct for differences in geometry, and you can do that. That impacts the S value if you're talking about the symmetry. Um, but the basic idea is apportionment factors. You, you can measure, make these measurements in different species, uh, even all the way up potentially to a monkey, uh, where you can take out tissue, normal organ tissue, and section it and assess the, the relationship between a whole organ uh, concentration or uptake of, of a certain agent. It's agent specific. Um, and then apportion that to the various subregions. So you would expect, even if you take it all the way to, let's say, cumulative activity, the sum of each subregion should add up to the total. And then it's the challenge of how do you make that happen in a, in a rigorous way. So that's kind of the, the solution that, that is a potential solution. It's, it's clearly complicated. And uh, it's, it depends. Clearly, an antibody is going to be distributed at the, at the micro scale in a different way, let's say, for the kidneys. Than, than a PSMA agent or, 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 a, or, a, or a peptide. So the solution is there, it's just complicated and a matter of getting it to happen and, and making it work. Okay, I, I guess I'll throw one thing out there that I know like for our um, some neuroendocrine patients with the lutetium dotatate that, you know, there's various levels in terms of kidney function on these patients. So it just seems like it'd be pretty tough to use kind of a, kind of a generalized scheme there, but is there any, do you have any comments on that? Just the fact that, you know, oftentimes these patients that we're treating have a comorbidities and other things that really complicate the situation. Right, so yes. So to the extent that comorbidities influence these sort of model-based apportionment factors, that's a real problem. Uh, I mean, to the same extent that in any given patient, you don't really know what the radio sensitivity is. So I, I mean, it's, it's providing a, a number. It's sort of like, if you think of the old MERD committee uh, uh, S-value based uh, phantom representation of how you do a calculation, it's similar, but on, on the micro scale. 
So, so it's not going to solve the other issues that are clearly going to be pertinent, but it takes us one step closer to addressing the issue of how do you, how do you go from a macroscopic to a microscopic uh, distribution of your reagent. Um, I mean, the other thing that the other implication of that, of course, is that it doesn't apply to tumors because there is no standard anatomy for a tumor. There is standard anatomy for normal organs and potentially you can do across species, but it's not something that, that uh, is really amenable to tumors, but it's a really good question. It's something we've been thinking about for quite a while and trying to figure out how to approach it and solve it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, before I get to Emily's raised hand, um, you uh, may have noticed that um, Ling Zhang Meng has been answering questions. Uh, he may have gotten the most number of questions actually, uh, has been answering them in the QA box. Uh, so uh, please go back there and you know read his answers if you're interested uh, in what he has to say about uh, some of the previous questions that were posed to him. Um, there is uh, one question that came in from Neil Clinthorne that I'm very happy to see. Um, uh, who's done a lot of previous work on Compton cameras. So I think this is uh, pointed towards um, uh, Ling Zhang. Uh, Neil says many implementations of Compton cameras have sensitivity that's quite low. The ability to estimate activity is further compromised by the inherent Compton decoding penalty. Is the emission rate from alpha therapy high enough that Compton cameras make sense? Ling Zheng? Yeah, can I? Yeah, I, I got to say something because I learned all those tricks from Neil. <laughs> so so it's, it's great that Neil came to ask this question. So thank you. Um, I mean, so that it's not necessarily be an answer because uh, I believe Neil know, actually know most of the answers. But anyway, just, just my view here is I actually replied this uh, in text to, to Martin just now regarding almost, almost a similar question regarding do we have enough counts from alpha emitters to support Compton camera? So my, my, my written answer there was to was for, for Compton, it, it is well known, every time you detect one gamma ray, the angular uncertainty associated with this gamma ray is so much bigger than what you have one gamma ray in regular spec, just pinhole spec or in PET. Therefore, we, would, uh, we actually need many, many more counts in comparison in Compton camera than both PET and regular gamma camera to, to build the images of the same quality. So from that viewpoint, if the regular camera, regular gamma camera, pinhole camera is struggling in terms of delivering a, a good image, and that it will be challenging to me anyway to use Compton to, to get a good image out of it. But there's a, I think there's a, but on the other hand, there's a, there's, I would say there are two scenarios which I can think of that Compton might play a big role in here. One is for going really high energy. What if you actually interest in 909 keV or something, something above 600 keV? And then collimeter typically does not work very well. And secondly, there might be certain geometry that you can design a system that you have a sensor to be very close to the object, very close to be the, the object you want to image. In that case, because solid angle is so large, and then the actual sensitivity, actual raw sensitivity you get on common camera is large enough. Therefore, you might be able to have a really compact collimeter free imaging system, compact, low cost, lightweight, imaging system to image those alpha emitters. So that's another scenario which I think Compton might, uh, might play a role in there. But the other, the other thing is um, there is a plenty of study we have, we have published on this too. So combining Compton camera and the regular, like a multiple pinhole camera. So they, they each have their sweet spot in, in terms of energy spectrum. So it typically, uh, I, I remember by the time I was doing this, the conclusion in our paper was below, below 300 KeV and call emitted camera, maybe it would be better. And then between 360 K, 600 KV is, is kind of a hybrid collimation. You put a Compton camera behind a multi pinhole camera will be, the, will be the best approach in terms of signal noise ratio. And then above 600 KV and Compton becoming, Compton becoming a, a, a sweet spot. So that's, there's another, that's another thing that Compton can come into play. So I was thinking about those three scenarios scenario that Compton may play well in, the, in terms of imaging alpha emitters. And I actually, actually like to make a, like one more re remark here because many of the things we're talking about, the new capability, they, they're depending on new sensors. Not necessarily be uh, cadmium zinc telluride, cadmium telluride, there are many other, uh, other type of new semiconductor sensors. 
like a selling bromide or many groups and in here are developing, we're working on some other semiconductors. And those semiconductors may have, may hold, may hold a, at least part of promise for future in this field because they, they might be able to give you the, the fantastic energy resolution provided currently by cadmium telluride, CGT, or germanium. On the other hand, they might be able to make do it much cheaper. Therefore, those sensors, well, I, I can see those new materials might play a big role in the future, not only in alpha, but if you invest in, in terms of under the context of alpha, we may benefit spec imaging in the longer term. So I'm, uh, I'm a little le learning from, uh, I mean, following what Eric, Eric, uh, in his, uh, Eric Fry in his talk in terms of we need more investment in the fundamental technology to, to advance this. So I very much, very much agree with his viewpoint. Thank you. Yeah, that's exactly those kind of out of the box new ideas that we wanted to uh, spawn here. So it's it, it's great to um, yeah, talk about them and uh, maybe even move in the direction of, of testing some of them, uh, perhaps first in simulations and then uh, hopefully in hardware that, that may work better. Um, Emily has had her hand up for a while. Uh, would you like to uh, come in with a question or a comment? Right, I'll try to be brief for the sake of time. So my, my, my first comment was actually uh, discussed a lot by George um, about the accuracy we can get at the voxel level and not only for alpha emitters, but also for beta emitters. Um, a lot of my research focuses on Y90 and there's a, still a lot of questions we have at the microscopic level, understanding how the radiation um, interacts with the tissue and how this creates toxicity, for example. So I think having um, voxel level or even smaller uh, dosimetry accuracy, and by dosimetry, I mean it comes from the imaging, but also the, 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 the dose calculation modeling that we have um, after the image uh, that shows us the activity distribution. So you combine all those uncertainties. So I think having some tools to better model this is in fact very important. And that brings me to uh, my second comment. And I was very happy to see on um, last, uh, last slide, which was great, what the different opportunities that he laid out very nicely, um, uh, that he was also thinking that we need better maybe image theory, um, which for me uh, relates to modeling as well, because then there are multi-scale modeling tools that we need to develop um, to connect those macroscopic images that we can have with the microscopic level that we need. And that also applies to modeling the radiation detectors, which is a little bit different. Uh, but as Lars mentioned, he said there are uh, SIPM uh, features that we can improve the radiation detectors. So I think having some integration of those models is important. And it would be great to see uh, NCI and IBIB uh, funding opportunities where we can submit broader modeling um, proposals, then again, just tailor to one application or the other. Uh, meaning if it's cancer and it goes to NCI, maybe our work can be a bit broader than that. It serves um, more people than that. Uh, thank you. Thank you for your comments. Um, actually, I'd like to go back now to uh, a question uh, that John Hum proposed uh, earlier. Uh, and this uh, may even be a good concluding question uh, where we've got five minutes left in this uh, panel discussion. Uh, so uh, John asked a question to everyone in this session. Uh, uh, thank you for uh, the, the broad approach here. Uh, is anyone building a full ring spec total body scanner? Uh, I might um, suggest uh, a full cylinder spec total body scanner, similar to the Explorer for PET. Does anybody have any ideas uh, or uh, any knowledge of activity in that direction? Or perhaps another way of asking it is um, clearly for therapy purposes, we would like to image the whole body because we're interested not only in uh, the tumor, but also sparing um, uh, healthy tissues. So a whole body scanner makes a lot of sense. Um, so uh, what would a uh, future uh, dedicated therapy spec camera look like? 
Is anyone building one? Or does anybody think of building one? General discussions, please. George, if I, uh, I may uh, just uh, briefly chip in. So uh, we are actually, we, we are in the, from the other end of the spectrum. We actually have a few system almost built looking for actually people to work with. On our, by the way, so this is a previous, we have a, for example, we have a smaller and small animal system already built uh, sitting on our table. So we have this, uh, this uh, fantastic energy resolution is touring stationary system. And we don't have, we don't, uh, sitting in our lab, we do have particular way to, to collaborate, to, to use it to image anything meaningful. We, we, we know it will be, will be very nice in terms of image offers. So we, we could we could make use of it. That's that's one of the things. The other thing is uh, there's a. Uh, so if, if I mean if people interested, we might have a system. Uh, for example, with that the one that we're, we're developing another CGT system is almost half done. Uh, this is for the for imaging the the prox, uh, imaging the lower extremities. So that system have a, a centimeter six CGT, which, which is a fantastic energy resolution. Again, with the, the ones I've been showing. So that system is almost half done. We're looking to. We're looking for uh, to to actually use the system, deploy the system at Yale in, uh, for example, mid next year. So that's that's our plan. So by mid next year, that system will be. So it's a, it's almost a full ring multi pinhole system with uh, spectral CGT sensors. That was actually designed for multi tracer studies as well. But so I would say that would be a very nice system to 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 test on, on any kind of alpha emitter system. So those are some of, some of the ongoing the ongoing ones. It's almost there. So if people want to try it, we'll be very, very open to see how do we adapt the system for the potentials. Okay. Uh, we have two minutes left and Robert, you have your hand up. Uh, so, you, yeah, uh, so uh, someone throws that out there. I mean, definitely that's one of the application areas that um, this kind of new technology that I'm interested in would be for being able to do whole, rapid whole body imaging studies. I think rather than making a tube that's two meters long, I mean, we have examples of already doing whole body um, planar um, bone scans that that's routine clinical things. We'd like to be able to do the same thing, but to provide tomographic imaging quality, um, you know, um, imaging capability with that in the sense that a lot of the stuff that we're going to be doing for this dosimetry work is kind of in a static environment that we feel like if you can image it, it's the, the time you have is really dependent on the clinical um, use of the, the resource. So, you know, if you can do it in 15, 20 minutes, like a regular kind of um, nuclear medicine procedure, we think it'll work well. And, you know, by having the technology that we're working on. There's also some dynamic imaging capability, but that would be more regionally based in the patient. So I think that, you know, we've already, in nuclear medicine, we've been doing whole body scanning for whatever, 50 years. And it's just taking that whole body scanning and making it a tomographic versus planar is I think where we need to go. Okay, we have one minute left. George, we'll give you the honor of concluding the remarks on both days. Uh, today and tomorrow. So uh, I see your hand is up. And uh, why don't you take the last uh, minute yeah. to before we adjourn? I, I didn't mean to to do that. I was just going to reinforce what Robert said. No. Uh, and also add to it the idea that the cost becomes important. There's this thing called financial toxicity, uh, you know, as some of these things get more and more expensive. And, you know, we certainly know that already, uh, Imaging for those symmetry is is a is a tall order, <clears throat> so so we don't want to make those instruments particularly expensive. Uh, I, I think that's another component to to the thing. I have no other deep insight on today's thing. I'm okay. Hoping. Thank you, thank you all. Uh, I think it's been a, a, a great first day. Uh, tomorrow is a half day where uh, after uh, today we've looked at the uh, clinical alpha therapy. Um, uh, background as, as, as outlined by uh, the oncologists in, uh, in, in the speaker uh, uh, lineup uh, and some very well-known instrumentation and uh, imaging people. Uh, tomorrow, we will look at, uh, take a closer look at isotope production, maybe look to the future of which uh, isotopes may be coming down the pike and um, also better understanding the dosimetry that uh, could or should be done uh, for these types of alpha therapies. 
Um, thank you all for being speakers, panelists, and thank the audience uh, for um, listening and typing in their questions. Um, we did have on the order of uh, 100 uh, attendees for uh, today's uh, workshop. Uh, hopefully, we'll get the same uh, number tomorrow. And um, thank you, Yasik, for co-moderating. Uh, would you like to give the, the last word before we adjourn? Of course, it was great. I've learned a lot and I hope that everyone will come back tomorrow for future um, uh, discussion of these issues. Thank okay, you. thank you all. Have a good evening. See everybody tomorrow.